Dr. Sudarshan Kapoor has warned you that Gandhi has many descendants. <laughs> so you have had, you've heard from Arun Gandhi, my cousin, Ila Gandhi, my cousin. Now you're about to hear me. I don't know whether this infliction is fair. <laughs> anyway, I thank you all very much uh, for welcoming me this evening in this absolutely handsome, classy auditorium. I'm utterly honored to be here. And I appreciate the hospitality of Dr. Sudarshan Kapoor and Meena Ben Kapoor, the welcome that friend Jim Grant has offered, the Interfaith Alliance of Fresno. Uh, Don Lopez, thank you so much for your kind words and welcome, and all of you for coming. Now, these lines uh, you're all familiar with, and if you're not familiar with, you ought to be familiar with them. And I might even ask you if you know who the author of these lines is. At the birth of each new era, with their recognizing start, nation wildly looks at nation, standing with mute lips apart. Victor Hugo, no. I'm continuing, I'll give you more of a chance. <laughs> uh, so the evil's triumph sendeth with a terror and a chill, under continent to continent, the sense of coming ill. I think the following lines you probably will recognize. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet tis truth alone is strong. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. Sorry? Kipling? No, not Kipling. Oh. Charles Sorry? Charles not Charles Wesley. John Wesley. Not John Wesley. <laughs> James Russell Lowell, that's right. <laughs> American poet, 19th century. So why do I quote this? Because, of course, I was given this theme, truth in this age of untruth. Uh, and because of these lines, at the birth of each new era, with a recognizing start, nation wildly looks at nation standing with mute lips apart. Something is happening in many countries today. This is the start of a new age, not necessarily a very pleasant age this age of untruth. Have you heard the word ethno-nationalism? You have, or you should have. And let me offer you my take on this expression, ethno-nationalism. We've all heard of nationalism, which has both good and negative connotations. Uh, nationalism can mean something in defense of, for the cause of one's nation, it can sometimes frighten neighboring nations, but within the nation, it suggests that you know everybody in the nation can do something. But ethno-nationalism, ethno-nationalism says that a particular group in each nation has the right to that nation. Not everybody in that nation. One group in that nation has a natural right to that nation, and the other groups can be tolerated. They may have a minor part, but they must honor the supremacy of this chief ethnic group. Okay? And it could be a tribal group in one country. It could be a religious group in one country. It could be a racial group in one country. So the idea that whites in the United States own the United States 
The Hindus of India own India. That is ethno-nationalism. And that is what is, with a terror and a chill, going under continent to continent, bringing this sense of coming ill. Um, now, the US and India are not the only examples. There is Turkey, you, you know what's happening there. There's Hungary, there's Brazil, there are other countries. Uh, I'm going to focus mostly on the US and India, and in fact, more on India than the US, because you know a lot about the US, and I know a few things about India. Um, the US and India are two amazing nations, why? The US and India are two amazing nations for this very important reason. Both nations, India after independence, the US after independence, founded not on a race, not on a tribe, not on a religion, but on an idea. You know, the old, nation, old idea of a nation, as you can see from the etymology of the word nation, it has to do with natality, of birth, some suggestion of a common tribe or a common race or a common blood. But no, no, no. The founders of the United States said the US is a nation of equality. Now, that idea of equality, of course, was not practiced, but at least it was paid wonderful lip service to. <laughs> we want to create a nation based on equality. At least that idea was expressed. This is going to be a nation not on, based on the bloodline, but on the idea of equality and liberty. Fantastic notion. India, after independence. You know, Gandhi is regarded as the leader of India's independence movement. Of course, millions of people took part in that movement. And certainly, independence of India is a phenomenal achievement for which Gandhi can claim a rightful share of credit. But let me tell you, much greater than obtaining independence from British rule was the launching of independent India as a nation for everybody. Not a nation only for the Hindu majority. A nation for everybody. India was also a nation, democratic nation, committed to liberty and equality. Idea, not race, not religion. India is for everyone, including for the agnostic, the atheist, certainly for the Jew, for the Zoroastrian, for the Sikh, for the Jain, for the Buddhist, for the Hindu, for the Muslim, the Christian, for everyone. So the US and India, both founded with this magnificent dream. Now, <clears throat> Uh, on the 24th, which is Monday, uh, President Trump is to be in India for two days. Um, <laughs> um, now, here is something that you can get online if you go to the Washington Post website. And I quote, if Trump, quote, wants to pick up a Gandhian message, he will need to find some quiet moments and remain silent and reflect on Gandhi's thought of crossing out the big I, capital I, said Rajmohan Gandhi the grandson of the revered independence leader and a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And the Washington Post story, which you can read online, continues. Trump could, quoting Rajmohan Gandhi, could, quote, focus on how to bring a polarized people together and how to diminish hate instead of encouraging it, unquote. Now, Uh, my wife, Usha, and I, we left Urbana Champagne yesterday morning, uh, left our home at 8 o'clock, 
Illinois time, Central time. It was six o'clock your time. At 7.30 yesterday morning, Illinois time, 5.30 your time, the Washington Post reporter telephoned me, asked me what I thought Trump might get in India. And I gave the sentence that she has quoted in the story in the Washington Post today. So, um, I'm going to quote some other uh, journal outlets in India, uh, because I think they may be of relevance to this theme of truth in an age of untruth. And this is from a journal in India called The Citizen. It's an online journal. And it also refers to the Trump's visit. And it goes like this. The building of a wall between the airport in Ahmedabad, which is where Trump will land, and the bridge named after Indira Gandhi, former Prime Minister of India, allegedly the, the building of a wall on this route that Trump will use, allegedly to hide the poor from the view of the US President, Donald Trump and his wife Melania, has been making the headlines in India. The explanation of officials that the reported 600 meter wall is being built to check quote unquote encroachment and is part of a repairs exercise does not seem to cut ice with people who are raising pertinent questions. The wall is being defined in the context of class with people pointing out that, building such a, that the aim of building such a wall is to hide poverty. People are saying that Indian politics, Indian politics, has graduated from garibi hatao, which means remove poverty, to garibi chipao, which means hide poverty, almost five decades later. And this person quoted in the newspaper continues, it, this is a slum where people of the Shar Sharanya community reside that the authorities are trying to hide from the gaze of President Trump. These people who live there are in the vocation of making and selling brooms. They were nomadic people, have been living on this piece of land for several years now. Quote, by making a wall, you're conveying that you're yourself ashamed of the government's inability to provide them basic humane living. You're conveying that only the rich and the middle classes matter to you, says Dakshin Chara, a cultural and social activist hailing from this Chara tribe. And this man says, it eventually boils down to the fact that you don't want even to acknowledge the fact that there are poor and marginalized people living in Gujarat, this part of India, where Trump will land first. And the poet and writer and social observer, also quoted in this journal, Paresh Vyas, speaks of the socio-historical dimension to the creation of this wall. The city of Ahmedabad, where Trump is going to land, has had an old association with walls, and with gates or doors known in the language there as darwazas. There are the walls that were built, but also these gates that were built. And the gates symbolize inclusion. The city has 12 darwazas or doors or gates. And Ahmedabad's folklore has many anecdotes conveying that whenever the rich and the mighty have tried to build walls, segregating the poor and the marginalized, Public unrest has compelled them to build darwazas, doors, gates. And there is this story about a man called Maniknath, about whom today there is a famous food court in Ahmedabad called Manik Chowk. It is said that each time Maniknath added a stitch to the quilt he was sewing, a portion of the wall being erected by the ruler around the city would crumble. Ahmedabad residents are proud of the city and its heritage. They scoff at Trump being taken to a renovated sports stadium for an event on the lines of the Howdy Modi spectacle held in Texas last year. Residents say that the government is keen to take visitors to venues that are symbolic, less populated, marked by its own understanding of development that revolves only around buildings and roads, 
Whereas the soul of Ahmedabad resides in its old mills, the heritage contributed by earlier rulers, including Muslim rulers, like the 12 Darwazas, Sidi Syed's Jali carved in limestone, the ancient Jama Masjid, and so forth. And veteran political commentator Prakash Shah tells this, this reporter, when it is people like Modi and Trump in power, walls do not come as a surprise. Does the government think that Trump would not know of the wall being built? But he will happily ignore it as he gets treated like an emperor. Quote, leaders like these prefer living in a make-believe world where they don't even acknowledge the existence of the poor. Who knows, Modi might tell Trump, I beat you in making the wall. <laughs> now, a sibling of untruth, a brother or sister of untruth is rage, rage. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a story of some rage and related to these protests that Dr. Kapoor mentioned that are now taking place in different parts of India. And I'm going to describe some initials to you. And you know, both the United States and India love initials. Uh, these three sets of initials Anyone interested in the future of India with 1.2 billion people should learn of these initials I'm now about to say. CAA is one, NRC is another, and NPR is the third. No, not the National Public Radio. Uh, but it's important to understand this. If you want to understand what's happening in, to 1.25 billion people in the world, Learn what CAA is, what NRC is, what NPR is. Now, CAA is a new law uh, promulgated by the Indian government, which changes the meaning of, a, of how someone can acquire India's citizenship. And you know what this law says? This law says that anyone who comes to India from neighboring countries and the countries I mentioned. Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan. Anyone who has come in recent years to India from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and who is a Hindu, or a Sikh, or a Christian, or a Buddhist, or a Jain, can have Indian citizenship. There is one religious group that is studiously not mentioned. Can you guess what it is? Yes. Muslims, no. Others can come in and apply and will get Indian citizenship, but if you're a Muslim, you will not. Such blatant, flagrant, specified exclusion is happening for the first time in India's history. And it has thankfully invited a tremendous protest. And I, when I arrived here earlier this evening, some wonderful members of, of this assembly told me, we are glad you're against CAA. Yes, I am against CAA. And I've taken part recently in protests against the CAA. Now, what is the NRC? The NRC is called, is the National Register of Citizens. And the idea is that everybody in India, 1.25 billion people, poor, illiterate, rich, whatever, everybody may need to prove that she or he is an Indian citizen, that she or he is an Indian citizen, and that her his parents were also Indian citizens. The burden of proof is on every individual. And in one part of India, in northeast of India, this exercise was conducted 
over four years. It was a tremendously costly and onerous and painful and torturous exercise. And the idea is to extend this exercise to the whole country. And of course, there is a tremendous protest because so many Indians don't have even a record of their birth, their own birth. To demand that they produce birth certificates of their parents to prove that they are Indian citizens, torturous. So there is an understandable protest. But of course, you know what the aim is, because the story that has been spread in recent years in India is that millions and millions and millions and millions of Muslims, mostly from Bangladesh, so the story goes, perhaps from Pakistan, so the story goes, perhaps from Afghanistan, so the story continues, have come illegally and landed themselves in India and are taking away your water, your air, your money, your medicines. We must identify these infiltrators, and the language that is used is we must identify these termites. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Language used by people in the highest places in the land. So we will conduct, we will create a National Register of Citizens, the NRC, to identify these infiltrators. And then we'll put them in detention centers, and maybe we will send them out. So when there was a tremendous protest after this onerous exercise in this particular part of India showed how onerous it was and people in the rest of India said, we can't have this here. So the government has said, well, maybe, maybe we may not have this exercise all across India. That is the latest word on the NRC from the government of India. But there's a third thing called the NPR, the National Population Register. So people will be required when the census takes place, and census is due in 2021, next year, when the census takes place, government officials will ask everyone, do you have records of your birth? Do you have records of your father's birth and your mother's birth? If you're not, then you're a doubtful citizen and you may not enter the NPR, the National Population Register. So there is an understandable movement in India against NPR as well. No CAA, no NRC, no NPR. That is what millions of weak, vulnerable, ordinary people are protesting, are saying. And I, it's essential that Fresno knows about this. You have immense problems in the United States, but you belong to planet Earth. You're part of humanity and you need to know what is happening in this man's country. Yes, the government has created this song that you heard, mobilized so many nations around the world, sing this magnificent song. And as Dr. Kapoor explained to you, the meaning of the song is, you're a good man if you understand not the other person's pain, the word is pariah, which means a stranger's pain. You're a good person if you understand the stranger's pain. But these strangers, we will identify them. We will exclude them from the register. We will put them in detention places. And we may deport them. OK? So this is. And yes, the protests are now taking place. And in the last nine weeks, these protests have gathered momentum. Who can predict what will happen? Will these protests succeed? We don't know. What is remarkable about these protests, in most cases, many cases, they are led by very humble, very poor Muslim women. women. Yes. Now, Muslims are 14% of India. 14% is a small minority, but if 14% of 1.2 billion is a lot of people, it's 200 million people or more. And so far, the Indian Muslim minority has adopted a low profile. We know there is prejudice about us, they say. We know that although we are 14%, we are only 4% in the Indian parliament. We are less than that in the Indian government services or in the Indian police, much less than that in the Indian army. 
We shouldn't talk openly. We will t adopt a low profile. We will let the Hindus, the broad-minded Hindus, the tolerant Hindus speak for us. We will stay quiet. No, no, no. This is too much. The CAA, the NRC, the NPR is too much. Say the Muslim women, the uneducated, poor Muslim women, and they are out on the streets in their hundreds of thousands. So this is happening. And they are nonviolent. And they are... And the symbol of their protest is the preamble to the Indian Constitution. It's not a religious symbol. It's a secular symbol. And they read this very short and very powerful preamble, which reads, like the American Constitution, starts with, we the people, and speaks of equality and liberty and fraternity and dignity. It's an amazing thing that's happening, but we don't know where it will lead because, 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 uh, those behind the present Indian authorities, powerful movement of intolerance, with a powerful appeal to ethno-nationalism, the Hindus own India, the British were there, and before that, the Muslims were there, and they came from the Middle East, and now the Hindus must come into their own and take their country back. Have you heard that phrase? Okay. So, and the way the media has been taken over, the television channels have been taken over, the universities have been taken over, democratic institutions have been undermined, judiciary has been undermined, so we don't know the issue of the contest that is taking place. So here is something from another newspaper called The Telegraph in India. There are some newspapers that are courageous. I mentioned to you this online journal, The Citizen, and this is a print journal, The Telegraph, which also has an online version. But The Telegraph, published in Kolkata, has been very courageous. So this person writes in The Telegraph about an incident that took place just a few days ago. So outside one great university in Delhi, called the Jamia Milia Islamia, with which you were connected. I taught there. You taught there. See, Dr. Kapoor has done so many things, including teaching at this university in Delhi. So my wife and I, uh, we were taking part in a protest gathering outside this university. It, it has a Muslim history. It, it has many Hindus on the faculty, many non-Muslims on the faculty and the students, but it was started as a Muslim university. And because of the protests outside this gate of this university, wonderful non-violent protests, all insisting on unity, equality, no violence, no hatred. So the other day, about two weeks ago, a man came with a gun towards the protesters. I'm going to shoot. And a day before he came with this gun, this young man, a leading politician, member of the government, referring to this protest and alleging absolutely falsely that these protests were violent protests, he said, he, he addressed a rally and again and again he invited the rally to say, you know, you've heard this you know, uh, about locker up stuff. So in this rally, the, the shout was, shoot them down. Goli maros, shoot these so-and-sos. And you can, I won't give you the actual words of the so-and-sos. Shoot these so-and-sos. So after these exhortations, this young man came with a gun. And uh, so the, uh, the media immediately showed this video of this man with a gun. And to see this man is part of this protest. He's now bringing a gun. And then within minutes when it was known that the man who came with the gun was actually anti the protest, 
He was not anti-CAA, he was pro-CAA. So the media immediately changed and the captions on the television screens were changed immediately into who provoked this innocent young man? What was the provocation that made this innocent young man take this drastic action? So this is what the Telegraph was writing about. You know, India has a national motto. I don't know whether the US has a national motto. Sorry? So India has a national motto, which in the Sanskrit language says Satyam Eva Jayate, which means truth ever wins. Truth ever wins. And of course, this man Joshi writes that in a country where the national motto is Satyam Eva Jayate, the operational motto of the people in power and their toady media channels is we can make people believe whatever we want, the age of untruth. And then it goes on to say, that a moment that will go unerasable into history are these banner headlines from one of these repugnant channels reporting the incident of this young man walking towards peaceful protesters, brandishing a gun, and then shooting a student. He did shoot somebody who was injured, luckily not killed. At first, the channel implies that the man is an anti-CAA protester. See, they are taking their protest now up to the pistol and shooting. When it becomes clear that the shooter has clear links with the ethno-nationalists, the channel flips the narrative and proclaims, end the provocation, stop provoking India, as if the shooter had somehow been provoked by the peaceful protests. Now, uh, some not so long ago, the US had this story about a certain Barack Obama, that he was really not born in the United States. Not only was he not born in the United States, he was a Muslim. And even today, a substantial percentage of the US population believes this. And there is an equivalent of this in India. Of course, you've heard of Gandhi. Have you heard of Nehru? Nehru was India's prime minister for 17 years. He was a very close young colleague of Gandhi's, much younger than Gandhi, 20 years younger than Gandhi. His name was Jawaharlal Nehru, and his father was also a very famous Indian politician called, who will answer in this class? Jawaharlal Nehru's father? Moti Lal Nehru. If you Google Motilal Nehru, you will discover the story that Motilal Nehru was a Muslim. Yes, he was not. He was a, not only a Hindu, he was a Hindu Brahmin, but millions and millions and hundreds of millions of Indians today believe that Motilal Nehru was a Muslim, and so Jawaharlal Nehru was a Muslim. He pretended to be a Hindu, but he is a Muslim and, of course, an appeaser of Muslims and prov provoking the Hindus. This untruth has been spread by social media, and hundreds of millions of people today in India believe this. Um, now, it should be recognized, I must, in fairness to facts, recognize that Prime Minister Modi of India speaks about Gandhi all the time. He says good things about Gandhi. On October 2 last year, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times on Gandhi. And the last line of the article was, quote, the world bows to you, beloved Bapu. Bapu is father, a word that many Indians used for Gandhi. The world bows to you, beloved Bapu, Narendra Modi. But in this article in the New York Times, 
There are two or three words that are absolutely missing. There is no reference to Muslims. There is no reference to the Hindu-Muslim question that has been a very major question in India for decades. And of course, one reason why Gandhi was killed was that people accused him, claimed or complained that he was too sympathetic to the Muslims. He wanted Hindu-Muslim unity. So that is not mentioned. The word equality is not mentioned. And one word not mentioned at all in this article by Modi on Gandhi, nonviolence. Can you write about Gandhi and not use the word nonviolence? Well, Modi has achieved this. So these are some aspects of a world of untruth. Now, here is something else I will, about another, by another brave writer writing again in the Telegraph. Democracy and populism both talk about people and hold the will of the people to be sacrosanct. Abraham Lincoln's famous phrase of the people, by the people, for the people, applies to a great degree both to populism and to democracy. In democracy, people are not defined with added qualifications. Populism, on the other hand, rejects the default definition of people in its quest for the, quote, real people, and sets criteria based on race or religion, nationality, language, and culture to determine who deserve to be part of the people. This definition of the real or authentic people is inevitably majoritarian in nature. Once the real people are thus identified, the rest are delegitimized and often demonized as the enemy of the people. Thereafter, a moral binary is constructed around this newly discovered definition of the real people. Honesty, simplicity, and wisdom are made integral moral characteristics of this group, while others are condemned as corrupt and dangerous. Does it ring a bell? So this is this man's very interesting and I think powerful explanation of the difference between democracy and populism. Now, in an age of untruth, rage is normal, this man coming with a gun to kill, and excesses are normal. Excesses in the application of the rule of law. Um, India's largest state in terms of population is Uttar Pradesh, often used called UP, not to be confused with the upper peninsula of Michigan. <laughs> but Uttar Pradesh, UP, has 250 million people. And it has as its chief minister, which is like your elected governor, a political leader who also belongs to the strong ethno-nationalist, Hindu right, Hindu nationalist group. Um, and the UP, India's UP, with 250 million people, has almost a 20% Muslim population. And there is a doctor there called Dr. Kafil Khan, a pediatrician, who was wrongly accused of being responsible when in a large government hospital in an eastern UP a city called Gorakhpur, two, three years ago, there was a terrible incident, when within a week, 70 children died for various reasons, including lack of oxygen cylinders, babies, newly born children. And this man who was the pediatrician in that hospital, he was framed and accused Although at the time, he had got, there was a shortage of oxygen cylinders, hospital administrators had not procured them. And he, realizing the seriousness of the situation, went himself uh, and with his own money, bought half a dozen cylinders to try and save some lives. He was put in jail. Uh, he was, then a year or two later, he was cleared of all charges, acquitted. But recently, although he was acquitted of that completely false charge, 
He was recently rearrested. He was rearrested because, like me, like my wife, and like millions of others, he was taking part in a protest against the CAA. And he's in prison now. He's in prison under a law called the National Security Act, which allows the government to put people in prison without any charge, without any trial, for two years. And the two-year period may be extended. So he's in jail, this remarkable man. Um, so that is sort of thing that is happening. Now I'll say a word or two about Kashmir, which some of you may have heard of. Now, on August 5 of last year, Kashmir, which has had a very uneasy relationship with the rest of India, uh, something drastic was done. And Kashmir, under the Indian arrangement, had a special status in relation to the government of India, giving it a good deal of autonomy, an autonomy that other states, most other states in India did not possess. On August 5 of last year, that autonomy was overnight removed. And from a state with special powers, unique status, Kashmir was changed into a union territory, like a federal territory, with no elected uh, legislators or, or, or rulers in the state. On August 9, four days after this, a Democrat representing a Long England, Long, sorry, a Long Island constituency on the edge of New York City, a man called Tom Sozi, wrote a letter to the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, expressing his anxiety that India's scrapping of the special relationship quote, risks provoking mass social unrest in Kashmir, which is a fact, and this is what he said. But some Indian Americans in Long Island, in New York, who had raised money for Swazi's election, flooded his office with angry messages. On a Sunday, August 11, on a Sunday, 100 Indian American donors to him, his election campaign, met with him in his home, and thereafter, Swazi issued an apology. This is what he said. Based upon my meeting, it is clear that it was a mistake to not consult with any of my Indian American friends and supporters before I sent my letter to Pompeo. I should have consulted my constituents before I sent my letter, he said. He did not say that he was wrong in what he said, but he said he should have consulted his Indian American friends, and I am apologizing for that. So this is my comment. If not consulting constituents before writing a letter calls for an apology, what would you say about not consulting any representatives of a population of millions of people before their territory is, quote, fully amalgamated, unquote, by a much larger power. Its status changed from a state of the Indian Union to a federally run territory. Because it is a fact that, that not a single Kashmiri individual, an official, a politician, was consulted before the Indian federal government took the step of scrapping Kashmir's special status. You have heard of the internet lockdown in Kashmir. You've heard that the unknown number, perhaps thousands, are still in prison. Many in prison, not only in Kashmir, but in different parts of India. The population is in deep indignation, but is remaining nonviolent. And among those arrested under the so-called Public Safety Act, which, like the National Security Act, also allows for detention for two years without trial, without charge, without warrant, among the people detained, detained under the Public Safety Act in Kashmir are Farooq Abdullah, Kashmir's eminent senior leader, a member of the Indian Parliament, his son Omar Abdullah, who has served as Chief Minister of Kashmir, Minister of State for External Affairs in the Government of India, Mehbooba Mufti, another former Chief Minister with whose party India's ruling BJP ran a coalition in Kashmir until June 2018, 
and a very interesting man called Shah Faisal, an independent politician in his late 30s. This man, Shah Faisal, young man, in 2009, he became the first Kashmiri to be placed at the very top, number one in the Indian Civil Services Examination. In January 2019, he resigned from the Indian bureaucracy because he was unhappy with what was happening in Kashmir. In March 2019, he launched his own political party. On August 14, 2019, a few days after Kashmir's special status was abolished, Faisal was detained at Delhi airport, where he intended to take a flight to Turkey and then on to the US. He was sent back to Kashmir, where he was detained, and in February this, this month, his detention was placed under the Public Safety Act, which requires, of course, no charge and no trial. All four that I've mentioned, the two Abdullahs, father and son, Mahbuba Mufti, and Shah Faisal, have belonged to Kashmir's pro-India camp. Remember this. Active, courageous members of Kashmir's pro-India camp, as distinct from other Kashmiris asking for independence from India, and yet they have been arrested under this draconian act. I've given you some examples, dear friends. The question to ask is, what can we do for truth in this age of untruth? One obvious way, of course, is to share the facts, as I'm trying to do this evening, to pass on these facts. The, third, the second is to preserve the record. It's very important to preserve the record of these things, because in an age of untruth, records too can be destroyed, and the truth can be denied. Speak out where you can. Applaud the truth teller when she or he tells the truth. And this is a very important point and one that is not always understood. Many of us who are unhappy with authoritarianism, with ethno-nationalism, with repression, with injustice, with unfairness. We are all in a battle together, but we are so critical at times of one another. So very important aspect of the fight against untruth, let's be nicer to our fellow fighters. Please remember this. Be nicer to one another in your truth army or in your peace and justice army. They have some good qualities. Then, oppose the lie, but hate not the liar. This is a difficult one. Oppose the lie, but do not hate the individual liar. I think he would endorse this statement. Do not close your heart to those taken in by the lie either. They're not evil people. They have some good qualities. You know, often the question is asked in this country, how do we talk to a Trump? How do we talk to a Modi? Of course, for good or ill, it's very unlikely that we will ever get to talk either with Trump or with Modi. The more relevant question, the more real question is, how do we talk to a relative, a colleague, or a stranger who likes Trump or who likes Modi? And there are many like that. Let such people know that we respect their humanness. Let's befriend him or her. Do not shut your heart against her or him. Find common non-political non interests that you can agree on and discuss. Truth has to be patient. Truth has to bide its time. 